you everyone for joining us. Um, sorry, we are um, in the 2024 edition of the Frontiers in Child Health Research Seminar, which, as you know, is held on the second and fourth Mondays um, of the month from September through June. And we feature speakers with work focused on child health from UCSF, as well as guest speakers. Let me know via email if you're interested in speaking or would like to suggest a speaker. Um, looking ahead to our next seminar, I just want to alert everyone that we will be in person on January 22nd for the Dr. Walter Miller Lectureship, which is hosted by the Division of Endocrinology. And the speaker will be Dr. Richard Auschus, I'm sure I said that incorrectly, from the University of Michigan. His talk is titled New Steroids and New Treatments for Congenital Adrenal Hyperplasia. That will be in the Oberndorf Auditorium from noon to one, and it will be followed by a reception. Otherwise, we're still virtual and using Zoom, and we ask everyone to stay muted unless you have a question, and we'll open it up at the end to questions. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Sharad Wadwani, um, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. Sharad's work um, focuses on the adverse effects of social determinants of health on outcomes related to pediatric liver transplantation and consideration of interventions to mitigate these adverse effects. His research has been funded by the NIH, a UCSF RAP award, the Starzl Network for Excellence in Pediatric Transplantation, and the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease. The title of Sherrod's talk today is Race, Class, and Allographs, Addressing Disparities in the Transplant System. Thank you so much for joining us, Sherrod. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I am thrilled to be here. Um, my objectives for today's talk is to first uh, start by describing the US organ allocation system, uh, and then have a, a discussion on how this system perpetuates racial and socioeconomic disparities. And then finally discuss some potential strategies to mitigate these disparities. Uh, first, I'd like to start with a story. This is about a two-year-old boy who received a liver transplant six months prior to me meeting him. He lived five hours away uh, in a transplant um, from our transplant center in another state. And about 12 weeks prior, he started to develop an intermittent cough and was seen by his pediatrician and started on albuterol and budesonide for presumed asthma. And then he developed diarrhea and an intermittent limp. And he was transferred to our ICU in worsening respiratory distress and diagnosed with diffuse B-cell lymphoma, which those of us in transplant know um, is a sequelae of PTLD, um, which is a uh, precancerous uh, um, outcome from, from immunosuppression. So I started to wonder how this could happen. And I was particularly in, um, curious about how this child's environment and health system contributed to this unfortunate morbidity. I was particularly curious about what resources were available to this child in his community, what access to primary care this family had, and how easy it was for them to get in touch with their transplant team. Really what I was wondering was how we could prevent this from happening in the future. And so <clears throat> I want to start with a definition of the social determinants of health by the WHO. The WHO defines the social determinants of health as the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, uh, work, live, and age, and the wider sets of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. To put another way, Francis Collins, the former director of the NIH, has said that if the DNA is our biological blueprint, the ZNA or our zip code is the blueprint for our behavioral and psychosocial makeup. And to put that visually, uh, this is a map of New York City. And you can see here the subway stops. And when you look at life expectancy, for children born in East Harlem and Murray Hill, which are just six subway stops away, you see that these babies have a nine year difference in life expectancy, really sort of visually depicting how the conditions in which we are born, live, learn, grow, um, and age really impact our health across the lifespan. 
So now shifting gears to um, uh, transplantation and the transplant system, um, I'll give you a little background on how the system works and then sort of highlight how the social determinants of health and the system kind of work together to perpetuate disparities. So when we look at the transplant system, transplant centers are monitored very closely on outcomes. Particularly, transplant centers are monitored closely on waitlist mortality and one-year mortality post-transplant. And these data are publicly available. So for example, you can go to the SRTR website and pull up uh, UCSF and get all sorts of statistics on our waitlist mortality and our one-year uh, and three-year mortality rates post-transplant. And so what this does is it creates a high-risk, high-reward system. The reward here, uh, speaking in financial terms, is that the total revenue generated from a transplant within the one month pre prior to a transplant to the six months after are as close to a million dollars here for liver and about half a million dollars for kidney transplants. And so as we think about patients as they travel through the transplant system, I think of uh, there's sort of four different buckets of care that patients travel through. The first is access, so, so getting to a pediatric transplant center. The next is getting listed and put on the transplant wait list where you wait for an organ to become available. Then there's getting the transplant and then there is surviving and thriving into adulthood in the post-transplant phase. So as we take a look at those phases, I'll highlight how sort of the social determinants of health impact each of those phases. And so starting in, in access to transplant, there is an ethical framework that guides organ allocation. And those, that framework, the backbone of that framework is the principle of utility or maximizing the net good to the population, keeping in mind that organs are scarce and um, how, how we balance the allocation of organs. So utility, justice, there needs to be fairness in how the organs are distributed, and then respect for persons, respect for the autonomy of the donor um, in deciding whether or not to donate an organ. And so these ethical um, principles are, are the backbone for the HRSA final rule, which mandates that the transplant system in how organs are allocated adheres to these ethical principles. And key to this is that uh, the organ allocation system is not allowed to discriminate on the base of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status who is allocated an organ. However, the journey to transplant listing leaves some behind. So in order for a child or adult to get listed, um, they first have to be referred to a transplant center, and then they have to undergo a transplant evaluation before they get listed for transplant. And when we don't have very good data in pediatrics, but when we look at adult data, uh, this was a study done at uh, the Veteran Affairs Hospital System, and they found that adults who lived further from their transplant center were less likely to be listed for transplant if they had end stage organ disease. And similarly, we see this in other health systems that um, Black patients are less likely to complete all of the steps to getting uh, listed for transplant and um, are, are less likely to get added to the transplant wait list. We see this in multiple settings. Uh, we also see that socioeconomic status is defined by household income is a predictor of, of um, being listed for transplant and public insurance is also predictor of being listed for transplant. So we wrote a piece about this, and what we talked about was that the, the system and the pressure that the system puts on um, outcomes creates a system where these vulnerable populations are less likely to be listed for transplant. So as I talked about, all of these data are publicly available. 
And what we know is that the, the data collection procedures only become available once someone is listed for transplant. We don't know who is getting evaluated and not listed, and we don't know who is getting referred and not getting referred. And so the first recommendation we made was to mandate data collection through the pre-transplant process, not just after transplant listing. To put this another way, uh, to start collecting data on everyone that gets referred for transplant evaluation, um, because this would allow us to understand what's happening in those closed door meetings where decisions are being made about uh, transplant listing. One of the things that happens when someone gets evaluated for transplant is they um, get evaluated for uh, medical necessity, um, but they also get a financial evaluation to ensure that they can cover, afford the costs of um, medications post-transplant. And so what we require, what we advocated for was really pulling back this ethical framework and mandating that we understand the financial security re requirements for transplant listing and make that more explicit nationally so that centers can't have different policies for who meets uh, the financial security requirements. The third recommendation we made was to find ways to incentivize transplant centers to transplant those with limited financial means. And one strategy for this could be having um, Medicare for all patients with end organ disease. So patients with end stage kidney disease, once you start dialysis, you automatically get Medicare uh, regardless of your age. And so we advocated that this could be applied to everyone with end organ disease and in need of a transplant. Okay. Uh, I'll start to switch gears to the waitlist period on, and um, a lot of our research that I'll be highlighting has used data from the United States Census Bureau. So a little bit of background on, uh, on some of the data sources that we use. The U.S. Census Bureau um, conducts this American Community Survey every five years. Um, they send surveyors out to different communities, and they understand the health of various communities and they have all of this health data all of this community level data available freely to researchers. Um, and they have geographical boundaries called census tracts. And these are um, geographical boundaries intended to capture relatively homogenous groups of individuals. And so they really um, are intended to get at neighborhood level constructs. Uh, so some examples of ACS data that you can get are percent of the population below the federal poverty line, percentages of households that are vacant, or the median household income of various communities. And there's been a, a you know a flourishing of research uh, using neighborhood level uh, constructs. The one uh, tool that we've used a lot in our research has been a neighborhood deprivation index. This is a composite index that um, that includes these six variables on the slide here. And the index ranges from zero to one with values closer to one indicating neighborhoods with um, greater neighborhood deprivation. To put this slide visually, uh, this index um, is available across the United States. Zoomed in here is the city of Cincinnati where the index was developed. And I put this slide here to highlight how much variability in the deprivation index there is within a city to really highlight that this deprivation index captures neighborhood level socioeconomic status. And so when we use this index to look at waitlist outcomes, so I'll, I'll now talk a little bit about the waitlist, um, just a little background on the waitlist. When a child is listed for um, transplant, the liver organs are allocated, allocated according to medical necessity. 
Um, we use something called a PELD or MELD score, PELD for pediatrics, MELD for anyone greater than 12. Um, and this is an objective score that's intended to uh, predict waitlist mortality. And so children with a higher MELD or PELD and therefore at greater risk of mortality without an organ are allocated organs first. Transplant centers can petition for something called non-standard exception requests. These are uh, exception requests that uh, transplant centers submit by writing a brief narrative, and they're intended to allow transplant centers to get patients more points when patients are sicker than what their objective score indicates. And these petition requests have about a 90% approval rate. For liver transplant, we can also offer living donor liver transplant, um, and these have more favorable outcomes uh, because you can transplant a child sooner in their disease progression, and uh, particularly with related donors, there may be some immunological benefits to receiving a living donor transplant. Um, but these surgeries are more technically challenging and they're not offered uh, at all transplant centers. So we conducted a study to really understand um, racial and ethnic disparities in waitlist outcomes and how neighborhood deprivation uh, uh, affected the, the disparities. And so what we found was that Black and Hispanic children were at increased risk of waitlist mortality. But when we included deprivation in our model and insurance status in our model, we saw the effects start to diminish. And when we included the initial PELD or MELD score, as a su surrogate for disease severity at time of listing uh, that, that captures sort of delays in access to transplant, we saw the racial and ethnic disparities disappear. Similarly, when we looked at receipt of living donor transplant, we found that Black and Hispanic children were less likely to receive a living donor transplant, which as I mentioned earlier, has a, a, a survival benefit to deceased donor transplants. And what we saw was that this disparity again um, started to diminish when we included deprivation insurance and initial PELD meld, suggesting that these social determinants are really driving these racial and ethnic disparities. So what are some of the possible contributors to these um, disparities and outcomes? Well, one of the things I mentioned was uh, the non-standard exception requests. And what we know is that in children who um, have uh, non-standard exception requests approved, they have a decreased risk of weightless mortality. Um, and what some of my colleagues have found, including Emily Perito uh, from UCSF, is that children with public insurance and non-white children we're less likely to have non-standard exception requests submitted. Uh, they had the same likelihood of having these exception requests approved. And so this sort of suggests that there are provider or institutional factors like bias and racism that are influencing the decisions uh, of transplant teams to submit exception requests for these minority and vulnerable children. So as we think about the waitlist period, I think a lot of what is driving out uh, the disparities that we observe is, is access to living donor transplant, the influence of the social determinants of health, individual and uh, socioeconomic status, um, disparities in, in who gets non-standard exception requests applied for, and then disease severity at time of listing, which uh, as I mentioned, is a surrogate of, of delays in access to care. Okay, sh shifting to the post-transplant period, which has been uh, the, the larger focus of my, my work to date. So looking at deprivation again, we found that uh, in, a, in a study across five US transplant centers, we found that participants who live in the most deprived neighborhoods have a 2X uh, increase in rates of medication non-adherence. And so um, 
On the x-axis here, you can see the deprivation index quartile of our cohort. And on the y-axis here, you can see the percent of patients with a medication level variability index greater than 2.5. The MLVI um, is an objective biomarker of medication non-adherence that's been validated in a prospective study. And this is uh, variability in tacrolimus immunosuppression levels, which is our primary immunosuppression. And when we've extended this to look at uh, outcomes of graft failure and death, we found that neighborhood deprivation is also associated with graft failure and death after liver transplant. Similarly, uh, I have a very bright medical student, Holly Schiffman, who has worked with me and has found that living in a health professional shortage area is associated with calf failure and death after liver transplant. And more recently, we found um, Jared Yalong, another uh, bright medical student, uh, looked at the impact of living in high air pollution neighborhoods and found that living in high air pollution neighborhoods, even when you adjust for the socioeconomic conditions of the neighborhood is associated with an increased risk of graft failure and death post-transplant. So how can we address these disparities? Um, well, one strategy I think is, uh, is better access to insurance. So in another study by Holly Schiffman, she looked at the effect of Medicaid expansion on transplant outcomes and she used these, this unique time-varying covariable analysis to conduct this analysis across the U.S. and found that uh, Medicaid expansion was associated with improved graft failure and death rates. And we looked at this in multiple ways and found that the same finding persisted. Um, and we also found that there was an improvement in racial disparities post-transplant when we looked at uh, Medicaid expansion. So this could be one strategy, um, expanding access to Medicaid insurance um, as one strategy to improve outcomes for these children. <clears throat> now talking at sort of the health system changes we can make to, to improve outcomes for these children, um, which has been a large focus of my K23. Um, in 2019, the National Academy of Medicine put out a report called Integrating Social Care into the Delivery of Health Care. Uh, and they talk about strategies that health systems can undertake to strengthen social care delivery. And part of that uh, report, there is a 5A framework. And these are five activities that healthcare systems can do to strengthen social care. Adjustment and assistance are strategies uh, directed at individual patients. So adjustment refers to adjusting the type of care we provide based on social risks and assets. So for a patient with transportation difficulties, uh, adjustment could be switching all of their clinic visits to virtual visits. And assistance strategies refers to providing direct assistance to patients. So that patient with transportation challenges, this could be providing a uh, taxi voucher to them. And then alignment and advocacy strategies refers to um, Activities the health system can do to strengthen the health of communities. So alignment is um, understanding sort of transportation routes um, and setting up, for example, satellite clinics in neighborhoods with, with poor transportation access to the health system. And then advocacy refers to advocating at a local state or national level for uh, you know, expanding transportation access, et cetera. And then overlying all of those is awareness, which refers to having a better understanding of uh, a patient's social risks and assets. And so um, the work that we've been doing is called the Social and Contextual Impact on Children Undergoing Liver Transplant or the Social TX Study. This is a study across nine US transplant centers in the US that are all part of the Society of Pediatric Liver Transplant. And our overall goal has been to identify strategies for the health system to intervene on social adversity for children undergoing liver transplant. 
And the whole sort of theoretical basis behind this study is to really start to break down these the relationship between social adversity and poor outcome and identify what the specific underlying risks are driving these disparities and then build interventions around those social risks. So our social TX study um, is a mixed method study. We have a quantitative arm where we're recruiting patients and families at the time of transplant. We're administering a social determinants of health survey and we are seeing how um, the social risks that are reported influence outcomes in the post-transplant period. And then we've also conducted a number of qualitative interviews with both patients and providers to understand uh, how social risks influence transplant care and where we may be able to strengthen care for these children. So one of the first studies we did was we wanted to understand how transplant uh, caregivers or parents felt about transplant teams asking sensitive social risk questions. So going back to that framework, really trying to understand how parents feel about transplant teams trying to increase their awareness. And so why would we screen for social risks? Well, the theory is that if we can detect uh, actionable social risks, we can improve the risk and improve transplant outcomes. And what we've seen in pediatric primary care um, by some of our colleagues here at UCSF is that uh, it can help, in, help tailor care, um, social risk screening can strengthen the patient-provider relationship, and it can also destigmatize social services. Um, in this randomized control trial, Patients who uh, were screened and had targeted intervention for identified risk compared to controls had a lower rate of hospitalization in the year following the intervention. So when we asked about 100 families across those nine uh, U.S. transplant centers, what we found is that only 6% of participants reported that screening was very or somewhat inappropriate. And when we followed this up with qualitative interviews, what these families told us is that caregivers really want to know the intention of screening. One caregiver said, if I knew this was for good reason, not just like how much do you make a year or what kind of car do you drive, I think in the right setting and with the right intention, it should be okay. Second thing that we learned from our qualitative interviews is that caregivers have a high level of trust in their transplant team. One caregiver said, I'm comfortable talking to, uh, to them about anything. They're like family. So they really trust us to, to, to guide them. And if, if they feel like we're screening for um, the best interest of their child, they feel comfortable with the screening. Next, we asked caregivers where they should be asked these questions. And um, over 50% said that they, they should be asked these questions in their liver clinic. And finally, we asked if the respondent had been screened in the past year, and over a third of the participants in our study said that they had not been screened in the past year in any healthcare setting, really underscoring the opportunity we have to screen children in our transplant clinics um, and potentially offer some support. Um, the next study that we've done was really uh, trying to understand how material economic hardship, a social risk, predicts adverse liver transplant outcomes. And so we screened participants for um, material economic hardship using a 10-question tool uh, from the Accountable Healthcare Communities. This tool uh, has been rolled out across federally qualified health centers. It's written at a um, fifth or sixth grade reading level, and it takes about one to two minutes to complete. And it, screen, it screens for these constructs here on the screen. And what we found was that the presence of material economic hardship predicts increased 90-day inpatient bed days. It predicts inpatient uh, increased inpatient bed days between 90 days and one year post-transplant. 
And it also in, it predicts increased risk of T-cell mediated rejection uh, within one year post-transplant uh, with about um, half of participants who have uh, material economic ha hardship having an episode of rejection within the first year post-transplant compared to about 9% of children uh, who do not report material economic hardship having an episode of T-cell mediated rejection. So then we started to ask um, families sort of how, how these social risks are influencing their ability to care, care for their child. And so we conducted a number of qualitative interviews, both with families and transplant providers. These interviews were about an hour in length and they were conducted via Zoom. They were semi-structured, so we used an interview guide and we adjusted the interv interview guide um, after sets of interviews to, to more um, accurately sort of capture the experiences of, of the participants. We really tried to over, over sample households reporting a social risk like material economic hardship. Some of the questions that we ask are, tell me about the biggest challenges of having a child with a liver transplant, or if you needed help paying for groceries, housing, or medication, what would you do? And we coded all of these interviews ac according to the Capability, Opportunity, Motivation, Behavior model, or the COMBI model. This is an implementation science model that's really used in developing interventions. And we identified a number of barriers and facilitators, and I'll highlight some of those now. We found that care caregivers are highly capable and motivated. Almost everyone we spoke to could off the, the back of their head just name their child's transplant care needs. They could name the exact doses of their medications that they need. Uh, and they had really explicit symptom systems for managing immunosuppression. Some had a whiteboard in the kitchen. Some had detailed logs on their phone. Um, but everyone had a system in place. This mother said, even when he goes to his grandparents' house, I pack his bag with it. I tell my husband, don't ever pack it, don't ever give it, because I'm doing it, and that's how it's always been. And these families were really able to anticipate system-level challenges. They were prepared to, to go through the complex scheduling process and, and schedule appointments during spring break, et cetera. Um, but these caregivers frequently encounter opportunity barriers. What I mean by this is that they talked a lot about the high indirect costs associated with transplant care, things like parking. Um, so this mother said, we spent thousands of dollars on parking because we were there every day for hours. We would max out every day. They talked about some of the challenges that they encountered with their employers. Some families talked about how their employers their coworkers rallied together to donate paid time off so that they could uh, take time off to care for their child, while other caregivers talked about the fear of losing their job because they had to make last minute changes to their schedule. This mother said, I could lose my job just getting my shift covered. It's stressful sometimes. You have to literally text everybody, can you cover? They talked about the limited flexibility in navigating the healthcare system. So they talked about how easy it was to get in touch with the transplant team, but when they had to make appointments within other aspects of the transplant system, within the healthcare system, um, they would get stuck in phone trees and coordinating care was often a challenge. And they also talked about the challenges in refilling immunosuppression, particularly for uh, Patient, uh, families with young children on immunosuppression who were on liquid tacrolimus, these families talked about how hard it was to make sure that they got the correct formulation sent to them. This mother describes, but by now they've made enough mistakes to where they've kind of gotten it down a little bit, but it's still every time I order, I have to. And she talked about this elaborate system of 
memorizing a certain uh, pharmacist's work schedule and calling them at a particularly time to make sure that they ordered, uh, created the right formulation of tacrolimus. According to the, the families we spoke to, they felt like the transplant teams were highly motivated to help them, but they were not necessarily aware of all of the challenges that they were facing. Um, they talked about how the transplant team, when they were made aware of some of these challenges, would take on the added labor and help them navigate these challenges. For example, this mother said, last week I went in, she made the appointment for an ultrasound and for clinic. It was all just taken care of in one fell swoop. But they talked about how the transplant team was not always aware of what was going on. This, this parent said, I did not find any of these community-based resources from the team. I had to find them out all, all of this myself because this first chunk of meds I had to pay for out of my pocket. When we went and did these qualitative interviews across these nine centers and included transplant team members, we found some interesting findings. Particularly when we spoke to transplant team members, we found that the transplant team members rely on a pre-transplant psychosocial evaluation to guide their understanding of a, of, a, of a family's social risks and assets. And they don't necessarily update their knowledge over time. The transplant team members we spoke to reported feeling uncomfortable talking about new social risks in the post-transplant period, citing a lack of, of knowing how to bring these sensitive topics up. And so they rely heavily on social workers to identify and intervene on new social risks in the post-transplant period. In turn, when we spoke with social workers, they reported feeling overburdened by both the quantity and the quality of the referrals that they received. Some social workers talked about receiving referrals to print a piece of paper out and deliver it to a patient's room or to help a family who lost their, their car keys in the parking lot. Um, things that a social worker is not really trained to do, um, and, and nor should they, they be doing these certain tasks. And when we spoke to, to families in the multi-center sample, we found that universally, these families all experience a high financial burden after transplant. And the added labor of caring for a sick child recovering after a major operation really compounds that financial burden. Um, Many caregivers have to leave or decrease their effort in the, the workforce, which further compounds their financial burden. Consequently, caregivers are dependent on their social network for generosity. So many caregivers talked about, you know, uh, relying on neighbors to help babysit siblings, um, family members who started a GoFundMe, uh, to help them raise money to, to, to care for their child after transplant. But they talked about how this support was mostly in the perioperative period. So support from transplant team members, support from insurance. So some insurance companies provide, you know, a, a dedicated nurse coordinator in the perioperative period. But after a certain time period, when you call the number that you're given, it, it no longer works. And so to put this visually, I think post-transplant, there's a lot of support needs immediately in the perioperative phase, and there's a, there's a lot of supports provided. But over time, the support provided decreased, but the support needed persists, which creates a gap. And so how do we strengthen social care in the post-transplant period? I think the low hanging fruit is that we should start routine social risk screening. As I mentioned, there are many tools available and they've been implemented in pediatric primary care. Um, and I think nationally, we're just now starting to talk about how to screen in subspecialty pediatrics. Then I think we need to start um, thinking about how we can streamline care processes to remove some of the hassle that families experience in the post-transplant period. 
it is a lot of work for families to care for children and it's a lot of uh, post transplant and it it's a lot of navigation and care coordination um, that really compounds the work that these families have to, to do. And then finally, I think we need to improve assistance and adjustment strategies in the post-transplant period. So going back to that 5A framework. So how do we center the stakeholder needs? Well, I've talked to you about how, um, you know, I think families need more support accessing benefits and coordinating care and how transplant team members need additional support in improving the detection of new social risks that occur and also finding ways to decrease the social care burden put on uh, busy transplant providers and, and busy social workers. So one model that we're piloting here at UCSF is a health advocate model. Health advocates or patient navigators um, are lay health workers. They don't have advanced medical training and they can help with care coordination um, accessing community resources and, and finding financial assistance programs for, for patients and families. And so we're still in a pilot phase, um, so I don't have a lot of data to share with you on this, but I will share a case study. So one patient that was enrolled in her pilot was a four-year-old female. She was transplanted at six months of age. And on um, social determinants of health screening, the family reported financial strain, fear of eviction, food insecurity, transportation challenges, and utility challenges. The mom uh, was not currently working, uh, and the family had lost CalFresh because the, the mother got COVID and did not have a chance to renew uh, their, their food stamp benefit. And they recently had bed bugs. The landlord had uh, treated the, the bed bugs for the family, but had them sign an agreement to cover the cost for extermination. The family was primarily Spanish speaking and didn't really understand what they were signing. And so when our first, when our health advocate first started working with them, the first thing that she did was have them help them complete a CalFresh application so that they could resume getting their food stamps benefit then she reviewed the copy of the contract with the landlord and found a free legal aid for them within their neighborhood. Um, she set up a call and attended the one and a half hour call with the family, with the, the lawyer, so she could help the family understand their options. Then she helped the mom format a resume and the mom was able to secure a job. And when we talked to this family, uh, they told us how how grateful they were for this program. This mother said, we met a social worker at the hospital and we stayed connected with her, but the bond was not as strong as with you folks. Um, and then she went on to say, sometimes due to situations you feel depressed, but now you have someone who can help you. Sometimes that person that cannot help you with everything, but still. So... This is still in a pilot. We're now seeking funding to, to see if this type of model can actually improve uh, patient health outcomes post-transplant. Um, so stay tuned. I, I look forward at a future date to sharing those results with you. And with that, I thank you for your time and, and welcome your questions and discussion. And or just unmute whatever's most comfortable for you. Um, sure, I, I'll start with a question. That, that was really excellent. Thank you, first of all, for sharing all that. Um, uh, these uh, uh, patient advocates, uh, who's who? Where's the funding coming from for that? Is that through your K award, or is there some other source for that? It's primarily through my K, um, and okay. then. Yeah. So right now we're using um, a clinical, our clinical research coordinator is serving as the advocate. Um, and yeah, now, now we're applying for an R to test this across centers. So uh, you're, I'm sure, familiar with uh, the niche program that 
uh, Maya Lodish has been uh, spearheading through the endocrinology group for patients with diabetes, kind of a similar idea of having uh, these patient navigators to help with uh, uh, patients who are from uh, these sort of socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods uh, who are high utilizer of the healthcare and have poor outcomes. And is there any coordination with the niche program that you're thinking about or are you working on a kind of a separate parallel process yeah um it's a good question we um we didn't partly for a couple of reasons we didn't initially uh partner with niche um because of how involved the niche program is they really um limit enrollment to geographically uh, sort of narrow areas um, because the the niche interventionists will go into the home or go to the school. And in pediatric transplant, because of how rare it is, you know, we have patients coming from very far away. So that model, um, as, as first described, I think was not really applicable to our population. And then the second piece, I think, is that um with with transplant as opposed to diabetes it's the not every child with poor immunosuppression adherence for example would be a high health utilizer there's not like a direct correlation you know in in, in stopping their immunosuppression and immediately having sort of high health utilization needs which i think is a requirement for enrollment in niche so for those two reasons we have kind of been working in parallel but would welcome the opportunity to part, partner with them in the future. You're going to be sitting across from them when you move into your office at MLK. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Did you have anything else, Rafi? I did have a question, but no, thank you. Appreciate okay. It. Um, also, Sherrod, there's a comment from um, Lena. This is an amazing body of work, and it's wonderful to see it all to come. Sorry. Come all come together into such a comprehensive body of work. Um, I would second that. Um, yes, I had a question about, um, you You know, you identified this family, for instance. Um, do you see this um, identifying these families that have these particular kinds of needs? Do you see that coming through the screening or do you see it as that there would be some sort of a routine kind of more one-on-one -on -one potential intake, like how, how do you see, and you mentioned about the high health care utilizers and, you know, sort of feeding into niche, but how do, how do you see this um, working? That's my first question. Um, and then my second question is kind of more general piece Like we see, for instance, with, um, you know, I, most of my clinical works in the nursery. So we see families where we're trying to um, get them help for doing paperwork, whether it's for insurance or other, um, you know, resources. And um, for some families that just seems to be even with that one-on-one -on -one help, like from the financial office or any, you know, other resources, social work just seems to be incredibly difficult to, to accomplish. So I just didn't, I wanted to know if you had other um, thoughts about, about those challenges and why those arise? Yeah, um, great questions. So to your first question, I think, you know, we now have data that that material economic hardship predicts adverse outcomes in the post-transplant period. And, and that feels like, you know, that we have a point of care tool to screen and identify families with material economic hardship. So I think um, routine screening because that's that's a construct that can vary over time. Uh, you know, if a if a family parent loses their job, that can precipitate food insecurity or housing instability. And so, routine ongoing screening, I think, will be a will be one strategy to identify those families at high risk. And then I think one of the the real benefits of this model. Um, to your second point is that because, you know, I think what we learned when we spoke with social workers is they they have so many sort of competing demands that they're 
trying to address, whether it's, you know, potential, you know, suicide attempt in the ICU versus someone, you know, who needs help f filling out their CalFresh application. Um, a lot of the work that our health advocate has been doing with families is not particularly hard work. It, it's persistent work. Um, and so I think having someone who has more bandwidth to really persist and to spend time, you know, Googling resources, calling these resources for the family uh, is really important for these families, particularly when they have a lot of, when their child has a lot of medical needs and they're also trying to sort of navigate the, the convoluted community benefit system. Um, you know, I think having someone who can spend that time with them to do that is, is really important. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Uh, Jim has a question. Gerard, thank you for um, really good talk. I want to strongly endorse the um, health advocates. Um, based on our experiences at a very large delivery service back at Brown University, we had a, a similar model employed for neonatal follow-up. So we had 9,000 deliveries, a really high throughput nursery service and a large follow-up program. And using initial neonatal research network funding and hiring um, past NICU parents, um, lay support persons, we called them different, but um, they were um, used to help coordinate the post-hospital care of these kids because a lot of them have visits to four or five different subspecialty clinics and they have similar uh, problems that you, um, you've identified. And we were able to reduce rehospitalization rate by 50%. Um, we were able to reduce ED visits a little less. It was significant. So, and it was later, the reason I'm bringing it up, it was later so effective that we were able to get a um, adjusted payment rate for uh, follow-up visits from insurance companies that would sign up for this because reducing hospitalization rate was extremely beneficial to them. So um, it's been written up. I could um, send you um, stuff on it, but, um, and and the other um, thing that worked out, the public health department also picked up um, funding uh, some of these health advocates. So um, knowing how to do this isn't the hard thing. Sustaining it with the resources is the hardest part we found. So. Uh, great work. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. Is uh, and I would love to to ha have anything that you have on on sustainability and partnering with insurance companies to get this type of model reimbursed because I think that will be the important piece. Uh, you know, once we if we're able to demonstrate efficacy, then then finding how to make it sustainable. Thank you. Uh, helpful because they are Spanish speaking. Um, yeah, I, I wonder in the subspecialty environment, you know, there are there is literature about um, cultural concordance, language concordance, racial and ethnic identification concordance. Um, I wonder if you find, um, or which of those, if any, you find to be obviously language most important in the subspecialty setting where I think you've shown us there's a lot of trust in the healthcare team kind of across the board, which is, which is fantastic and great and real, you know, obviously speaks to how hard you guys all work and communicate with your um, patients and the families. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, particularly in pediatric liver transplant where, you know, it's a pretty rare procedure. I think it's, it'll get hard to sort of have a staff of health advocates who are all sort of concordant with um, with the patient population. But I think at UCSF, it's been particularly, you know, um, successful having um, Bethany, who I see her on here, who has been our health advocate and, and is Spanish speaking and, um, you know, has done an amazing job relating to our patients and families. I think that that's really important. Um, 
to have at least language concordance. Thanks again so much for um, joining us and hopefully we'll see many of you in person in two weeks time. Thank you.